Welcome back to our channel. Today we're going to delve into an interesting and crucial topic for structural designers, member design. We'll provide you with valuable guidance and warnings to help you navigate the complex world of member design and avoid common pitfalls. From the importance of considering restraint to buckling, to serviceability checks and deflection considerations, we'll cover it all. So grab your virtual hard hats and let's dive into mastering member design. Now, you might be wondering why we're discussing member design in the context of analyzing steel structures. Well, my friends, the answer lies in the seamless connection between analysis and design facilitated by the widespread use of software design packages in our industry. These software suites have become an integral part of our workflow, allowing us to transition effortlessly between the two processes. In fact, for many structural designers, analysis and design are considered as one cohesive unit, like two sides of the same sturdy steel coin. Before we proceed, let me clarify something. We won't be delving into the nitty-gritty of computer-aided design in this section. Instead, just like in our previous discussions, we'll provide you with some valuable guidance and warnings to ensure you don't stumble into any pitfalls as an unwary or inexperienced designer. So, consider this section as your trusty companion, offering insights to help you navigate the complex world of member design. Now that we've established the importance of member design, let's delve into one crucial aspect, restraint to buckling. Picture this. You have a beautifully crafted steel rafter, simply supported and subjected to both gravity load and uplift load cases. In the gravity load case, all the purlins provide restraint. However, in the uplift load case, only those purlins with stays to the bottom flange actually provide the necessary restraint. Quite a difference, isn't it? This disparity means that we need to conduct separate design runs to check both cases, considering different restraint conditions. It's important to understand the nature of the assumed restraint by the design software. For instance, let's take the bottom flange restraint of a portal rafter. This type of restraint effectively counters buckling in the YY direction and lateral torsional buckling. However, it doesn't have any effect on buckling around the XX axis. Here's where things get interesting, folks. When a restraint is introduced, the design program may assume, by default, that it provides effective restraint against lateral torsional buckling and buckling in both axes. However, that might not be the case in reality. But fret not, because most programs offer the option to reintroduce the correct buckling length in the appropriate direction, ensuring accurate member design. Moving on, let's explore another crucial aspect of the process, serviceability checks and deflection considerations. I know, I know, it may sound technical and intimidating, but fear not. We'll break it down and make it super interesting for you. So, let's jump right in. By default, when we use general analysis and design software, beams and columns are checked for deflection within their own length. However, there's an important distinction when it comes to cantilevers. Only the tips of cantilevers are checked for deflection. Now, here's where things can get a bit tricky. Structural designers might be tempted to rely on this feature when checking the sway of a frame, assuming that the deflection quoted for a column would be the deflection measured at the top. But hold on a second, it's not always that simple. You see, the deflection quoted for a column is typically calculated within the length of the column itself. Take a look at figure shown. So if we want to apply the correct checks or base member design on the deflection of the column top, we might need to reclassify the columns as cantilevers. It's a small adjustment that ensures accurate assessments. Of course, when it comes to manual checking, displacements at nodes will usually be quoted as global displacements, not relative to specific elements in the model. Now, let's shift our attention to a different scenario that demands caution. Checking the deflection of a series of elements connected longitudinally, such as a truss cord. Here's where things can get a bit tricky again. 
the deflection quoted may actually refer to an individual element between nodes. So, to check the overall deflection, we must consider the actual joint deflections from the analysis output. Thankfully, some programs offer a handy feature to identify the elements to consider as a single member, simplifying the process. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about a game-changer section properties. When the deflections obtained from the analysis are close to the allowable limit, it's time to take a step back and reassess the situation. You see, the deflections resulting from the analysis are based on the initial section properties. While the design module may perform a pro rata adjustment during deflection calculations, a reanalysis with the chosen sections can be incredibly beneficial. Especially in rigid frames, resizing the elements will impact the distribution of moments and, you guessed it, the deflection of the entire structure. Now, when it comes to structural design, there are certain factors that need careful consideration. One of these factors is the effective lengths of elements. These lengths play a crucial role in determining the stability and behavior of a structure. So, let's take a closer look. Effective lengths, my dear viewers, are typically given default values in both the x, x and i, y directions. These values can be modified by the structural designer in accordance with the appropriate code clauses. And why is that important? Well, it allows for the customization and optimization of the structure based on specific design requirements. Imagine we have a truss as an example. The effective length of the top, also known as the compression boom, can be related to the positions of the nodes in one direction and the purlin positions in the other. This consideration ensures that the structure can withstand various types of loading conditions and maintain its stability. However, there's a twist. When we talk about the bottom boom, which experiences reversal forces, the effective length can be quite different from the distance between nodes. In fact, it's often much greater due to the presence of restrained positions. This difference highlights the importance of the structural designer's role in reviewing and amending the assumed effective lengths to ensure accuracy and safety. Now, let's switch gears for a moment and discuss another critical aspect, destabilizing loads. In a conservative default condition, these loads are usually taken into account, but there's always the option to make changes. And guess what? It's the structural designer's responsibility to carefully examine and evaluate these conditions. Why is this so important? Well, destabilizing loads have the potential to, well, destabilize a structure. By thoroughly assessing these loads and their effects, the structural designer can make informed decisions to enhance the stability and performance of the structure. We'll be exploring the concept of minimum weight design in structural engineering and why it's not always the most cost-effective solution. Now, many design programs offer a fantastic option known as the minimum weight design. This feature allows engineers to generate a lightest section that meets all the necessary code requirements. It's an incredibly handy tool that saves us from the hassle of repeatedly designing different sections. After all, there's no point in providing excessive capacity when it's not needed. However, as you might have guessed, the lightest solution isn't always the cheapest one overall. When we approach a minimum weight solution, fabrication costs start to soar dramatically. You see, one of the main reasons for this cost increase is the need for local stiffening at the connections. As the design becomes lighter, it becomes more crucial to reinforce specific areas to maintain structural integrity. And unfortunately, these additional reinforcements can be quite expensive. Another factor that affects fabrication costs is the level of standardization and repetition. The more standardized a design is, the more cost-effective it becomes to produce. However, as we move towards a minimum weight solution, standardization and repetition decrease resulting in increased fabrication costs. It's important to keep this in mind during the design process to strike the right balance between weight and cost. But that's not all. A minimum weight solution can also lead to practical challenges 
when it comes to connecting various members. As the weight decreases, we might end up with sections that are physically small and difficult to connect effectively. For instance, members with flanges too narrow for 20mm bolts should generally be avoided. We certainly don't want to compromise the structural integrity or create unnecessary complications during construction. Speaking of connections, it's best to avoid connecting to the webs of shallow sections, especially if these members are also connected to the flanges. Doing so can create congestion at the connection area, causing difficulties during construction. Additionally, notching the members connected to the web might become a necessity, further adding to the complexity of the project. It's all about finding the right balance between weight optimization and practicality. Let me illustrate this with a practical example. Imagine you have a project where you need a column to support four floor beams. Traditionally, you might consider using a 152 UC column, and it would certainly meet the design requirements. However, here's an interesting alternative. 103 beam used as a column. Surprisingly, it can satisfy the design requirements just as well while providing better access and eliminating the need to notch the beams. It's all about exploring innovative possibilities. So, while minimum weight design solutions offer incredible advantages by optimizing structural sections, it's crucial to consider the associated fabrication costs and practical limitations. Remember, the relationship between cost and weight is a complex one, as shown in the figure provided. For more detailed guidance on cost analysis and connection capacities, you can refer to the figure provided in the Design for Manufacture Guidelines. Furthermore, when it comes to designing structures, efficiency is key. Design suites go the extra mile by providing a minimum depth design option. This brilliant feature ensures that the shallowest section, while still meeting code requirements, is produced. It's all about optimizing space without compromising on strength. Now, picture this. You have a multitude of load cases to consider, each with its own unique impact on the structure. Design suites empower you with the freedom to handpick which load cases are included in specific checks. For strength evaluations, you can rely on the ultimate load case combinations. And for serviceability checks, appropriate, unfactored load case combinations step in. It's a tailored approach that gives you the flexibility you need. Let's talk about simple construction. Design suites have your back when it comes to eccentric connections to columns. With just a few clicks, you can generate nominal moments and include them in your design process. This feature adds an extra layer of accuracy, ensuring that even the most intricate details are accounted for. Who knew designing could be so dynamic and intuitive? Designers are no strangers to choices, and design suites make it easier than ever to compare various member types. You have the freedom to switch between universal beams, universal columns, hollow sections, and more. This flexibility allows for swift comparisons, ensuring that you select the most suitable member types for your project. It's like having a virtual toolbox at your fingertips. Last but certainly not least, we have a truly remarkable feature, the ability to reanalyze the structure based on the most recent design choices. Imagine this, you've gone through the design process, but something doesn't feel right. Design suites come to the rescue by providing you with the opportunity to reanalyze your structure using the sections chosen in your latest design. This way, you can assess any significant changes in forces, moments, and defections. It's like having a safety net to catch any potential discrepancies. And there you have it, folks. We've covered everything from restraint to buckling, serviceability checks to deflection considerations, effective lengths, destabilizing loads, minimum weight design, and so much more. As structural designers, it's essential to stay informed and make the right choices to ensure the stability, safety, and cost-effectiveness of our structure. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more engaging content on structural design. 
feel free to leave any questions or comments down below, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for joining us on this journey to master member design. Until next time, keep designing with precision and creativity. Stay tuned for more exciting topics and valuable insights. See you in the next video.